It's official. Android 4.0, codenamed Ice Cream Sandwich, has been announced and looks like a pretty big step forwards from Android 2.x. Never mind the novelties like a new font and face unlocking using the front camera, I was more interested in the fuller NFC support, including content sharing with other Android 4 powered phones, the improved voice input, the reworked virtual control buttons that slide out of the way, possibilities, the better web browser with Chrome bookmark syncing, the reworked and social aware contacts app, and the whole new camera application and interface. Add in better Google Plus support, of course, and a number of items seemingly copied from other OS. There's WebOS's swipe apps to close them from the task manager. There's iOS 5's swipe notifications to remove them individually. There's iOS's drag icons into each other to create folders. And if I'm being a little snarky, there's the Nokia N93's photo editor from 2006. Overall, though, a decent major version upgrade and one I'm looking forward to seeing in action, possibly first via an upgrade to my Nexus S. Announced at the same time was the new Google flagship device, the Samsung-made Galaxy Nexus. It's cutting edge in all the ways that Android 4.0 needed with a huge 4.65 720p resolution Super AMOLED display. That's a 1280 by 720 pixels, amazingly. There's a dual-core 1.2 gig processor and 4G LTE or HSPA Plus technology, depending on the model and market. The screen is curved, as with the Nexus S, which probably means no Gorilla Glass. The Galaxy Nexus is 9mm thick, which seems about the sweet spot for this type of smartphone. Somewhat thinner at 7mm or so, if you don't count the huge bulge at one end, is the also brand new Motorola Droid Razor running Android 2.3.5, which suddenly seems rather old. <laughs> There's a 4.3 inch quarter HD Super AMOLED screen, all the usual specs, including 8 megapixel cam with 1080p video recording, 1.2 gig processor, 1 gigabytes of RAM to help with the usual web top Ubuntu embed and lap dock use, 16 gig of mass memory, and nice, a 1780 milliamp hour battery. It's also reputedly ruggedized to a degree. Hopefully it'll be upgradable to Android 4 when the time comes. And so to Mango, Windows Phone 7.5. It's what Windows Phone should have been from the start, of course, but it's here now. Not all third-party apps have been recompiled to take advantage of the instant resume pseudo multitasking, but that'll happen over the next few months now that the OS is here. Reports of sales over the last year have been lacklustre, to say the least. But then I don't think any manufacturer has really pushed the platform. It's been down to geeks like me, admiring the new take on the smartphone UI. And I haven't seen many Windows phones in high street shops, which tend to lead with Android and BlackBerry these days, and maybe Symbian Bell coming up, uh, plus the iPhone, of course, if they've got it. All this will hopefully change this week as Nokia announces at least two Windows phone smartphones, which I'll report on in the next phone show. A lot has been written about Nokia over the last year or so, most of it extremely negative. Symbian has been written off so many times, yet even at quarter three 2011, almost as many Symbian smartphones were sold worldwide as iPhones. Yes, really. Uh, and with Symbian Bell, Nokia just gave that OS a new lease of life too. The in part, the continuing large sales numbers from Nokia are driven by their enormous distribution. It's in more countries and markets than anybody else. And it's exactly this reach that Microsoft was banking on when it signed up Nokia as a special Windows Phone partner back in February. Without Nokia, Windows Phone was always going to struggle to make an impact, coming a full three years after the iPhone and two years after Android got going. With Nokia, Windows Phone Mango at least has a fighting chance. And if there's any justice in this world, Windows Phone should succeed. Just as Apple did in 2007, Microsoft went back to the drawing board and completely reinvented how a smartphone should feel in terms of interface. For its underrated Zoom music players at first and then in full-on smartphones, and the result is largely stunning. For many real-world activities, such as looking things up, the ease of use and the sheer amount of joined-up thinking in Windows Phone Mango is impressive. I'm a Symbian nut, as you know, and out of the box, a Symbian phone manages to give me a half-decent email experience and a rather clunky and laggy social one. Mango has a fast and slick multi-service email client and full integration of Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Windows Live, all into its main contact system. Out of the box, it all syncs and just works. Here's the people hub then, animating some of your friends up on its live tile. Tap through and there are the most recent social updates and thoughts across all services for all your friends and family, viewed either with a scrolling pane or in a slightly gimmicky way by thumbnail. But here starts the kicker. 
tap a contact, in this case, uh, Michael Hell, and you see their full context profile, along with all the ways you can contact them, tweet them, mention them, write to their wall, etc. Swipe right, you see all their updates on all platforms. Swipe right again, and there are their photo albums, courtesy of Facebook. You can just browse through. Within seconds, you're up close and personal with all your friends' lives. Really nicely done, Microsoft. Another example, search. Last week, my boiler packed up. Fan heaters pressed into service right, left and centre. It was freezing. Where to find a boiler engineer? Type boilers into Bing search and swipe right to local and there are three results close by. And you can tap through to see full details and phone them. Let's try a search where I need to go somewhere. I'm in a strange town on holiday and my family fancy going ice skating. <laughs> tap or say ice skating into the search box and a range of matches are shown. I can tap the map to make it full screen, or I can tap on one and see full details, including being able to start navigating there. Now, yes, I did say navigating. That's stretching it at the moment, since Bing Maps just shows your position following a pre-calculated route. But Nokia Maps is imminent on Windows Phone, and it will bring the, the very best navigation system in the world, currently only on Symbian, to this platform. And that's when Windows Phone will really go up a few notches in everyone's estimation, I expect. You get the idea, it's swipe-tastic, with just a few omissions here and there. But the overall vision, well, everything you want to access, suggesting other pivots, i.e. other views, other data, then needing to take appropriate action, all of which is suggested at just the right point, without having to keep switching applications, is terrific and a breath of fresh air. I, for one, am so glad Microsoft started from a clean sheet of paper with Windows Phone. Other highlights include the Office Hub here, uh, mobile versions of Word, Excel and PowerPoint all being built in and all fully cloud aware, at least if you don't need direct access to Google Docs. And the live tile system, which almost works brilliantly. I say almost because it's uh, terrific for quick access to things you do most, but it can get a bit laborious for power users, as can the ever growing list of applications as you install more and more. The downsides of Windows Phone Mango. Well, this is me, right? So there has to be a load of negatives as well. The multitasking, well, it isn't really, and far too many applications and services, even recompiled ones for Mango, simply cannot work when not in the foreground. So in Podcasts Pro here, for example, I have to stay in the app and wait and wait and wait while each podcast episode downloads every single time. Where's the background downloading? Yes, yes, there's, there's podcast functionality built into Zoom Desktop, but this brings me to negative number two. I hate Zoom Desktop. Having to manage all my media from within a dedicated Windows application sucks. It's restrictive. It's time consuming. All videos have to be transcoded for mobile. Come on, Microsoft, this is 2011. We're supposed to be free of having to tether everything to a PC. And no, it's not OK that Apple does this too. That doesn't make it right. And you're limited to what you can put on your Windows phone in the first place. You get the eight gigabytes or so of mass memory and, well, that's it. No micro SD memory cards, no USB on the go, no expansion, no anything, just a block of memory that you have to manage very carefully indeed. Let's put all of this in context in the mobile world. I, I love the uh, simplicity of iOS, but I'm appalled by some of Apple's lock-in policies and their attitudes. I love the unrivaled geek flexibility of Symbian, and files, Bluetooth sharing, full multitasking, expansion, gadgets, the works. But I hate the way the tech world has abandoned development for it. I love Android for most of those same reasons, and it's hyper customizable, but I hate the way this has caused the Android world to be so fragmented. I love Blackberry's hardware, but I hate its software. There, I've said it. And in similar fashion, I love the breath of fresh air that is Windows Phone. I love its concept. I've even grown to like its lowercase, large fonted look, but I also hate its limitations. Can Nokia, with its mighty cloud and apparently exclusive access to the internals, open Windows Phone up, just a bit. Let's hope so for all our sakes.